just wasn't loud enough. <laughs> um, in any case, John uh, got us started with uh, the three angels message. And I just felt like we should continue. And um, the Lord put the second angel's message uh, on my heart. Um, uh, in one of my next sermons, I may go back and, and pick up part of uh, one of the first angel's message. Um, but uh, the, the message for today is that Babylon has fallen. Babylon is fallen. And um, I, I just want to take a moment to have a word of prayer as we consider this thought. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm not capable of conveying what you want each one of us to understand. So I am depending upon you to give me words to say, and I'm depending on you to put your words in the ears of each of the hearers here so that everyone hears in their own language, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Now today is a doctrinal sermon, and we talked about when we first became a church, we talked about we wanted to hear the doctrines of the church. Now that has become kind of unpopular in a lot of circles, and it, it kind of hurts me when I hear people uh, saying that we need to downplay the doctrines in favor of the love of God. And to me, I, I think it's egregious to place truth and love on opposite poles of a spectrum because they belong together. And it seems like, you know, the whole Christian world seems to be going in the direction of uh, where the Samaritan woman was at that Jesus talked to at the well. And, and he said to, he, to her, he said, you worship, you know not what. And I see the whole world heading in that direction where they have de-emphasized truth to the point where they no longer uh, know who or what they worship. And they have uh, included so much in their worship that it is, bears very little resemblance to what the truth used to be. John 4, 22, I'll read that passage. For ye worship, ye know not what. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Now, this is nothing new. I think throughout the history of the world, people have gotten off the path of truth and began to think that it didn't matter very much. At, at uh, Mount Carmel, when the worshipers of Baal were asked, you know, if the Lord be God, worship him, and if Baal be God, worship him. And they answered him, not a word, because they honestly didn't know the difference by this time. You know, they had a lot of spirit. They had a lot of fervor. They had a lot of love. They were probably very nice people, but they didn't have the truth. Truth is so important and so vital. You know, the whole issue of the three angels' message is to bring the world back to truth and a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But you say that doctrine is divisive or divisive. Yeah, it is. You bet your life it is. In fact, in Hebrews 4.12, 
it says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We live in serious times. We need a serious message. There is something in this latter day with which we must maintain a wide separation. And that's what this message of today is about. You know, Revelation 14 is the fulcrum on which the whole book of Revelation turns. And it, it's sad to me that most of the Christian world has the idea that, that Revelation should not be studied because nobody can understand it. And to me, that is such an absurd position to take. It's as if God says, I'm going to give you this book, and I'm going to call it the Revelation of Jesus Christ, and I am going to say, blessed who reads and understands, but it's just my little joke because nobody can really understand it. And, and that is just so ludicrous to me. Yes, it is to be understood, and yes, it does take a little work. And this is why uh, many of the people in the world do not understand it because they don't bother to go to the trouble of learning what the symbols mean and following through with a consistent theology. Um, but we have been blessed in this church with forefathers who studied deeply and have passed on their knowledge to this generation. And we need to pass this message on to the world. I just wanted to say something about the structure of Revelation while I'm on the subject. Um, Revelation is not a chronological work. It, it is not sequential. It does not follow a straight line. It uh, is organized basically in a chiastic structure. That is, it reaches a point somewhere in the middle and goes each direction from that. But it is a uh, collection of word pictures, like a photo montage, where you can stand back and look at it, and it means one thing. You stand up close, and you see something else. It repeats and enlarges, repeats and enlarges. And all of apocalyptic literature is like that. And the book of Daniel is very much like that too. For instance, in Daniel 2, uh, we have the history of the world portrayed by a statue. And this is basically the political history of the world. And it's an outline of the history from the Babylonian Empire down to the end of time. And then uh, in Daniel 7, uh, the same history is presented from a military point of view by fierce animals. And here again, you have uh, the picture of the whole history of the world, but we have some additional features, such as uh, a little horn is introduced, just briefly. And then we have the whole history of the world revealed again, but this time it's the spiritual history of the world, and it is through sanctuary animals and sanctuary language that, that this third picture is revealed. And the little horn feature becomes very prominent. And then the rest of the book is basically talking about that particular image. And that, that little horn has been variously known in scripture, 
as uh, the uh, as Jezebel, Babylon, the mystery of iniquity, the Antichrist, and of course the little horn. And Revelation 14, verse 8, is the message of the second angel, as we call it. Uh, I'm going to just kind of go over the, the first angel's message um, because I think it's important to, to set the stage. And I'm going to give it in the... Houston unauthorized version uh, of the Bible because um, I, I paid particular attention to this in uh, the Greek. And Greek is such a more powerful language than is English. Um, it's interesting to me that languages have been deteriorating over the centuries. In fact, even in our lifetime, language has deteriorated a great deal. And it has been doing so since language was uh, first established. And so we can't even convey in English some of the things that, was, that were possible in Greek. And, and so, you know, I... Uh, just want to read a little bit from Revelation 14. And if you'll turn there, we're going to do spend some time here. Pages are falling out. And it says in English, I saw another angel. Uh, in the Greek, it would say, and I saw another messenger of a different kind fly in the midst of heaven, fly in the midst of midair, having uh, the everlasting gospel, having the, um, the good message, Ionis, the ultimate good message is really what it says in the Greek. Ionis only means time when it's referring to time. When it's referring to a message, it's the ultimate message. And so this is the ultimate message to give to the world. It is enormously important. And the first words out of the good messengers message is fear God. Now, there's no way to convey that in English. Uh, we, we say, oh, it means respect. But you know, I, I respect a policeman, I respect a teacher, I respect uh, a judge, but I don't fall down on my face when I see one. And this word, phobeos, means to proskuneo, means to fall down and, and absolutely recognize his grandeur, his greatness, his enormity, his goodness. And when you see that, every individual who ever saw that in vision even, fell down on their face. And yet we have in the world the idea that God is our good old buddy. And that we can trifle with him. And, you know, he's lucky if we even come to church at all. And I think the, the whole concept, you know, God wouldn't have said this, the first words out of his mouth, fear God, if there was not going to be an issue with that in the end time. And we need to recognize there's a big issue with that in the world today. People do not fear God. 
And so we have a message. Fear God. He doesn't want you to be afraid of him. He wants to, you to recognize who and what he is. And that brings a certain element that we can't express in English of, of fear. Fear God and give glory to him. You know, when I first read that, I thought that meant well, that we're supposed to, you know, do a lot of praising, and I suppose we should, but that's not really what giving glory to God is all about. Giving glory to God is about making him look good through our lives. So we give glory to God through our characters, because any time you see glory, you can substitute character give character to him in other words give uh, people a picture of who he is why because the hour of his judgment is come and John told us about that last week but there there's another thing about Greek that you can put words together in such a way to make a double entendre. That doesn't mean one or the other, it means both. And the writer of this, John, the writer of this, put that together in a way that the King James tried to grasp and it said, for the hour of his judgment is come. Now you can look at that is does the judgment about him or is the judgment belong to him or uh, but in the in the Greek it is very clear that it means both auto which means the hour of crucial decision concerning him has come. Now, Chryseos was the point in the trial where a verdict was called. It was a point, it's the word we get, that we get crisis from. When somebody's in a medical crisis, it's going to go one way or the other. When in a court situation, when the crisis came, it was going to go one way or the other. A verdict was going to be called. And so when it uses this term, with regard to God, what's important is what we have decided about him far more than what he has decided about us because he's already decided about us. He wants us. The question is, do we want him and worship him? Proskuneo, worship him who made. Worship him who made things. This was, design, this was shown to be an issue at the end of time. Worshiping God as the creator is a big issue in the world today. Evolution has gotten its fingers into the church. <clears throat> and if we are not worshiping God as creator, we are not worshiping God. We are worshiping some other thing. And then it begins the second angel's message and it says, and I saw another messenger, a second one of the same kind. Uh, and there followed another angel. Um, and there followed another angel saying, this is verse 8 if you're following along, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
Now, a lot of churches are just intimidated by the enormous implications of that message, and so they basically don't teach it. But we need to kind of slice through this message and, and try to understand what is meant by all of this word picture that is made to us. And there are a number of things that we can notice right away about this message. In the first place, it's a short message as compared to the other two messages. Secondly, it's a quiet message as compared to the other two messages, although this same thing is repeated and enlarged uh, later in the, in the Bible, in Revelation 18, and it is extremely loud at that point. Thirdly, um, uh, well, let's, let's go back to the beginning and, and go with they're followed. Now, they're followed another messenger of the same kind implies that there is a causal relationship uh, and it's not necessarily sequential. In fact, um, in, in the Greek, it, it comes across as more literally, uh, this messenger came after and accompanied the first. So we can recognize that this, this message followed shortly after the first, but then it accompanied alongside, and these two messages are to be given together. And um, why then is it not a loud voice? We'll come to that in a little bit. But uh, it says Babylon is fallen. Now, John was well aware that Babylon had ceased to exist as a nation for over 500 years before he wrote this down. So he wasn't talking about literal Babylon. He is talking there about a symbolic Babylon. Now, all through the history of the Bible, there has, there has been a um, kind of a competition set up between Jerusalem, the city of God, and Babylon, the uh, city of Satan. And so we need to take a look at the identity of Babylon. And it's not really hard to, to figure out, even from this passage alone, we have so much corroboration throughout Scripture about who this Babylon is that, uh, that it's very easy to establish, and we don't have time to go through all of it here. But if anybody has a question about who Babylon is, uh, see me or one of the other elders or one of the ladies, if you prefer, because it is, it is dead simple to establish who Babylon is. In this passage, it's a she. And she is great. Um, you know, history itself is replete with examples of the fact that Rome was also known as Babylon. You see, when Babylon fell as a nation, um, the religious structure, that is the magicians and the magi and so forth, they went to Pergamum and they established there a center of false worship in Pergamum. And, and that's why it says in Revelation, that's where Satan's seat is. Okay, and when Rome was just arising, 
Pergamum was the first to recognize Rome as a political entity. And they had a dramatic impact and influence on the early Romans. And they, uh, Rome basically adopted a lot of the principles uh, that uh, were established there. Now, Babylon, uh, was important uh, as a cultural center, and it was uh, very great, and it had a tremendous amount of influence on people. Babylon still has a tremendous amount of influence today. You know, that's where astrology came from, that's where numerology came from. You know, they, they had a pantheon of 36 gods, each one had a dominion over 10 degrees of time and 10 degrees of space. That's why our compass has 360 degrees in it. And that's why the clock is easily divisible into 36. And that is why there's, you know, the, the fact that we have the Babylonian calendar had 360 days. And so they, this is the basis of numerology. It's the basis of so many things. Now, each of those gods had a number from 1 through 36. But then they had another god who was the god of all gods, and his name was Marduk. And you can guess what he was. He was the sun god, of course. And he was not god number 37. He was the sum of all the gods. And so if you add up 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 through 36, what do you get? Any mathematicians here? 6, 6, 6. six, six. And that is the original origin of that symbol. But there is a lot more deep meaning in that symbolism uh, that you can glean as well. But... Um, We have a because there. Babylon is fallen, is fallen because. And we can take a look at what was the uh, proximate cause of literal Babylon's fall. And it's hinted to in this verse, because she made all the nations drink of the wine. The wrath. As you remember the story of Babylon, you will remember that uh, Belshazzar, the king, uh, was drunk and was having a party while the uh, Medes and the Persians were surrounding the city. They felt secure. They were in the impregnable fortress. And so they had a party and they called for the cups that they had stolen from the temple in Jerusalem. And they drank wine from those cups. And this was when the moving finger wrote, Mini, Mini, Tikal, you farsen. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And the reason, the proximate cause was they made no distinction between the holy and the profane. And this has been repeated throughout history. There, that has been the cause of so many falls of different things. Nadab and Abihu made no distinction between holy fire and common fire. And in our end time, we're looking then at some in this picture that is presented here, we're looking for some entity, it's a she which makes it a church in prophecy, who makes the nations drink of the wine, making no distinction between the holy and the profane of the wrath of her fornication. And uh, it's not a very pretty picture. 
but um, we need to go with what is wine in Scripture. And as we, we study this, as it is used in prophetic uh, language, we discover that wine is false doctrine. And so we have a picture of a church then that is promoting false doctrine and making no distinction between the holy and the common. And she makes all nations drink of this. So the wine of the wrath, you know, we, we have this word wrath and it's applied here and it's applied in the, in the third angel's message also to God. But the word is not really wrath. It's as close as they could come to it in the English. The word is thumos, which in, in the Greek means exceptionally strong emotion. And that could be wrath, but it could be other kinds of strong emotion as well. And so we're looking at a, at a false church, a corrupt church, who is making the other nations drink of the wine, the false doctrines of the strong feeling of her fornication, that is, illicit relationship between the kings of the earth. Religious fornication is, is basically um, to uh, mix with the secular or to mix with other religions. And uh, I, I've just got to point out that I don't think in the history of the world, you know, we see kind of a compiled uh, example of what happened during the Middle Ages during the long period from uh, the year about 300 to the year about 1700, of all of, the, all of the compounded errors that had crept into the church. And these had crept into the church over time, and they came in, uh, you know, somebody didn't wake up some morning and decide, let's put a whole bunch of errors into the church. These came in through the culture. And every culture thinks they're exactly right. They have it exactly right. Everybody previous to us has got it wrong and everybody else out there has got it wrong, but our culture has it right. And every culture in the history of the world has thought so. And we think so too. But there has been more error creep into the church in the last 50 years than there has been in the last five centuries. Syncretism, joining together with, to, to mesh, to merge, to fornicate, to mix the holy with the profane, and this is the condition that the prophet sees and iterates through the idea that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, one of the reasons why people make no distinction between the holy and the profane historically is, uh, is found in Leviticus 10, 9, where it tells uh, the priest, do not drink wine or strong drink. 
thou nor thy sons with thee when ye enter into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may be distinguish between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. Now, as a church, we recognize the need to stay sober. These are sober times. We recognize that we should not drink alcohol because it can cloud our vision and cloud, you know, the, the faculties through which Jesus speaks to us. And, and we don't dare cloud those faculties. But it means more than that as well. It also means, you know, the, the clouding that we can get when we are drinking the wine that is the false doctrines of the world. And some of those things can be intoxicating. They can be exciting. You know, there's... <laughs> Somebody did a research and, and during the height of the popularity of the Left Behind books, uh, they were selling, selling a whale of a lot more of those than they were of the Bible. And it was intoxicating, and people got excited. And, you know, they had a certain amount of thumos about them. And, and so people began to mix speculation with their religion. Now I'm going to go to Revelation 16:12. And this is talking about another messenger. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the earth might be prepared. We don't have time to go into all of that, but it's an exciting time that is just before us. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. You notice that Satan has its counterfeit, his counterfeit for just about everything. You have the false trinity here. You have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And you have three unclean spirits like frogs. Why frogs? Because their power is in their tongue. And these are the three devil's messages. And they go out to deceive the whole world. And we have then been given a responsibility to counter the, the charges of these three. And we don't know exactly what they say, but we can be sure that they're saying just quite the opposite of what the three angels say. You know, the, the three angels or the three messengers say, fear God and give glory to him. And the three frogs say, uh, don't fear God. Dress down. Be casual. No, he's just our good old buddy. He's not going to hurt anybody. And, uh, you know, they have this picture, basically, that he's some kind of a Santa Claus and that uh, reverence and decorum are old-fashioned and should be done away with. The three angels say, give glory to him, and the three frogs say, give glory to Christian rock bands, give glory to mega churches, give glory to individuals and Hollywood and TV faith healers. No one, no one is interested in making God look good anymore through their character. Everyone 
wants to feel good through the thumas, through their intense excitement. And that's what the churches of the world are offering up in our day. It is a religion that has no resemblance to the faith given to our fathers. Revelation 17, starting in verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit unto the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-covered beast, having the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. There are so many symbols in here that point directly to uh, the Roman Catholic Church. But I, I want to uh, interrupt myself here to to say that the second angel's message is not specifically about the Roman Catholic Church. It's more about her daughters. Uh, and the woman was arrayed in pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, uh, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. Okay, if she's the mother of harlots, that means that she must have daughters, obviously. And she's committing adultery with kings. Where do we get that, that imagery from in the Bible? Well, we have it repeated twice. And um, one of them is with John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so the first uh, example of this was with Elijah. And here we have Elijah, and we have a harlot woman committing adultery with a weak king, and she had her minions, in this case, they weren't literal daughters, but they were spiritual daughters in the prophets of Baal. And here we have the Elijah figure, who was the target of the woman, but the daughters were the dangerous figures. In John the Baptist, here we have it even more dramatically, where we have the harlot woman and the weak king, Herod, and we have the daughter, Salome, and the sinister individual was the mother. The one with the power was the king, but the most dangerous figure was the daughter. And so we have it in our world today. We have this harlot church, and we have the kings of the world who are only interested in getting elected and retaining power, and they will bow to the people when it is demanded. And we're working up towards the end where there will be a death decree as there was for John the Baptist. But in the meantime, it is the daughters of Babylon that are the dangerous figure. Because the daughter of Babylon is good looking. The daughter of Babylon is talented. The daughter of Babylon seems innocent. 
And so we need to recognize that we live in sinister times. And yes, we recognize that the, that the papal church, which are our ancestors, by the way, just as much as they are the modern Catholic's ancestors, they went astray. But now we have a whole host of daughters of Babylon, and they're going astray faster than that mother ever did. Here's a quotation that I think you might get some value from. It's from the fourth volume of Spirit of Prophecy, page 232. The term Babylon, derived from Babel and signifying confusion, is applied in scripture to the various forms of false or apostate religion. But the message announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to some religious body that was once pure and has become corrupt. It cannot be the Romish church, which is here meant, for that church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. But how appropriate the figure as applied to Protestant churches, all professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divided into almost innumerable sects, the unity for which Christ prays does not exist. Instead of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there are numberless counterfeit creeds and theories. Religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the world uh, know not what to believe is truth. God is not in all this. It is the work of man, the work of Satan. You know, I realize that this is not a politically correct sermon. It may not be popular in our world today, or even legal in some places, to say that the trendy churches of today are fallen. But they are. We have no business sending our doctoral candidates to their universities. Babylon has fallen. We have no business going to seminars to learn from them how to do worship. Babylon has fallen. We have no business reading their novels. Babylon has fallen. We have no business watching their movies. Babylon has fallen. We have no business adopting their music. Babylon has fallen. You know, we have so many examples of that. You know, that, 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 that people, I don't know, people are so busy they, that they just don't notice what's coming on the world. And we have, you know, started some time ago with the whole idea of the seeker-centered church. In other words, to take the, take the central focus off of God in our worship services and put it on people, the seeker. We need to focus on the seeker and his needs. And you are told that you come to church to have your needs satisfied. Satan knows that if you do that, you won't get it. Because the only way to get a blessing is to be a blessing. And so we have the whole idea that, you know, the, the church has to cater to the needs of the people. And that God is there to give us what we want. And this has pervaded the Christian world and it has affected our own church as well. Every church is affected by it. This is part of the wine of Babylon, the emergent church movement, which 
was a syncretistic movement, which was, you know, there, there's a deliberate effort out there to bring religions together, not just Christian denominations together, no, religions. And so, you know, the, the emergent church idea is just full of Eastern mysticism. It's just full of all kinds of Hindu and, and, and so forth types of uh, traps. And so it is one of the ways it's going. Centering prayer, you've heard of that, probably. If you haven't, you will. Where the whole idea is to find that space where nothing exists. You know, it's a, it's a type of um, meditation. It's Eastern meditation. There's a difference between Christian meditation and Eastern meditation. We are told to meditate, and we should. In thy word do I meditate all the day long. I don't try to empty my mind, I try to fill my mind with scripture. I think more and more of God. But Eastern meditation is, the whole idea is to chant a mantra and, and to push the whole, everything out so that there's nothing there but empty space. What did Jesus say what happens when, he fi when the devil finds an empty space? He brings seven of his friends and moves right in, and that's the whole idea. And we need to beware of such things. There's all kinds of mysticism. You know, this whole idea that we live in a generation where we can't promote truth because, you know, we, we live in this era where these kind of alien people that are called postmoderns live. Uh, there are people who don't believe in truth and that they can't be reached with telling them truth. And so what the, the whole idea is that you try to enculturate them into the church. You make friends with them and you, and you know, you gradually nudge them a little closer to the cross. And what happens is you finally get them to the place where they feel good about themselves. And there is no place in this whole scenario for repentance. The only way that we can come to Christ is through repentance. And we don't get nudged towards the cross. We fall at the foot of the cross. And we have such strong um, pull towards these things because they come to us through our culture. And that's how we know most things, is through our culture. You know, Ezra and Nehemiah were written uh, after the fall of Babylon. And Ezra and Nehemiah had a hard time getting people to come out of Babylon. But they had an even harder time getting Babylon out of the people. And we are in that phase in our own church and in our own lives. And frankly, I need to take a look at myself and see where Babylon has inculcated itself in me because we are not immune to the temptations of this world. We need, you know, when um, Cyrus came into the city of, of Babylon, the minute Cyrus was in the city, Babylon fell. Cyrus was a type of Christ. That is, he represented Christ, even not in character, but in, in his action that he conquered Babylon. And Christ, when he comes inside, is what conquers Babylon. And the best news in all the world, if you are a child of God, is that Babylon has fallen. 
And Babylon has fallen, if so be that you have invited Christ into your life. But it will try to raise its ugly head, believe me. And this is why we have been given such stern, stern warning. And you haven't heard anything yet because the third angel's message is the most fearsome message in all the world, in all history, because this is a serious matter. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have conquered Babylon, that you have overcome, and that we can be part of that victory if we recognize you as our Lord and Savior, if we fear God so that we will have nothing to fear and give glory to him through our lives and characters and worship him who made everything for us. Lord, we invite you into our hearts. We thank you that you have conquered this city. And we pray, Lord, that you will use us as agents to reach others for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.